I'm ready. All right. Good evening, folks. It is January 10th, 2023, and none of us expected to be here, but we are. Uh, this is a special town meeting, and um, it is now being convened. I so rarely get to use my gavel that I am pulling it out. So, well, actually, I'll use it at the end. Oh, it's on my, oh yeah, here it is. Okay, what the hell? Anyway, okay. Um, so the warrant for this meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes I cover the mic. The warrant for this meeting has been properly served and publicly posted, and the return of service and posting has been acknowledged. Uh, we will now have the singing of the Star Spangled Banner by Vina Priestley, who has graciously acknowledged to do this, and we are very grateful for her. What so proudly we live at the twilight's last evening, whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the red hearts we watch. We're so gathered, we streaming, and the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, give proof to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled and I get away for the land of the free and the home of the brave. That was beautiful. And now the uh, Indigenous Peoples Land Acknowledgement will be read by Selena Silver Robinson. As we gather today's town meeting members, let us take a moment to acknowledge the history of this land we call Brookline. This is the unceded land of the Massachusetts people whose traditions, language, and stewardship continue today through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog. Today, we are living on the land that was taken by force. By 1641, the colonists in Brookline had allocated to themselves almost all of the land that had been inhabited by the indigenous people. Land was not the only form of theft that occurred. Lives were also stolen. Historical records state that in 1675, during King Philip's War, seven indigenous men were sold into slavery in the Caribbean by residents of the area that we now call Brookline. The seven men represent part of the early slave trade. Slavery in Brookline continued and grew, but soon those enslaved were African or of African descent. By 1746, enslavers claimed ownership of over half of all of Brookline land. We acknowledge the theft of land, culture, and lives, and the ensuing enslavement of indigenous and African peoples that occurred here. These early policies set the stage for centuries of systemic racism. As we remember these atrocities, town meeting members and the larger town must commit ourselves to address the ongoing inequities that are the result of our history of colonialism. 
and racism. Although we as individuals were not perpetrators of these atrocities, we benefit from these systems. Thus, we dedicate ourselves to addressing them today. Thank you, Felina. And uh, Heather Hamilton has asked for some time to speak to town meeting. Ms. Hamilton. Oh, I'm here. On? Oh, you're there. Okay, great. Uh, good evening. I was actually going to do this in my remarks at the later portion of the meeting, but I, oh. I can certainly do it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so good evening. My name is Heather Hamilton. I am on the select board. I'm the chair. Uh, I have a personal announcement to make. Uh, it is with a heavy heart and deep gratitude that I announced my resignation from the select board as of February 1st. Changes in my professional life require me to end my tenure three months earlier than I would have otherwise preferred. These past five and a half years have been a wild ride for the town. We've seen it all together. Legalization of marijuana, the hiring of nearly every single department head, including our town administrator, redistricting, a global pandemic, and the hardest challenge of them all, scooters. Serving on the select board and as the board's chair has been a great honor. I want to thank my fellow board members, both past and present, and have been, you have been great colleagues, partners, and friends, and I'm a better person and leader because I had the privilege to work with you all. I want to thank town staff, I'm so proud uh, to work for an organization that has attracted such talent. The community relies on you all every single day and you continue to deliver excellent results. I wanna thank our community. You all have supported me, a girl who was not born here, didn't go to school here, doesn't have kids in the schools and doesn't own property. My resume may not look like the leaders before me, but thankfully this town supports leaders who look out for the best interests of the town. Even when the, that leads to our leaders to take controversial or initially unpopular positions, something I have been accused of more than once during my tenure on the select board. With those principles in mind, I want to leave you with one final thought. Brookline's municipal government is broken. Our town is too complex, too demanding, too much for its executive branch to be headed by five unpaid part-time volunteers. This is not a slight against volunteerism or the noble women and men who served on the select board before and with me. This job just cannot be done well part-time. One cannot oversee hundreds of millions of dollars in budgets and hundreds of employees in only a few hours per week. For too long, we have asked unpaid volunteers to dedicate dozens of hours each month that is not feasible for residents with significant professional or family obligations. Public service should not be a path to prosperity. It should also not be a path to pauperism. Brookline deserves full-time democratically elected leadership. We deserve elected leadership who pour their full energy into making Brookline the municipal paragon it should be because that Brookline is worth the investment. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, I am saddened to hear your announcement. I wish you the very best and I thank you very much for your service over the past five years. On to much more mundane things. Um, I will go through some details, uh, just cursory details to remind people that you should use the chat line only if you have a question or comment. Uh, want to make a privilege motion, and I sent out a reminder today as to what constitutes a privileged motion, or you want to call a question to end the debate. 
I think you folks remember how to vote on Zoom. It cannot be changed once you have submitted it. But if there was a technical reason why your vote was not submitted, you can contact the town clerk and have it corrected. If you missed it because you stepped away, that is not a valid reason to have it corrected. <clears throat> the votes will be voted the next day, posted the next day, so you can see if your vote was correctly posted. If you are participating by phone rather than Zoom, I will call on you to cast your vote, state your name and your precinct, and how you vote. Pursuant to the Act of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that have authorized remote participation in representative town meetings due, the, due to the COVID health emergency and that have reauthorized such meetings and been extended through March 2023, we are holding this special town meeting virtually. Uh, Heather Hamilton has moved to approve that this meeting be held virtually and Dennis Dowdy has seconded that motion. We are going to now vote on it and you will have 30 seconds for your vote. Oh, I'm sorry, we did not have the slide ready. Um, so give us two seconds to prepare for that. Yeah. I apologize. It was the moderator's responsibility. I take full blame. And this will be the last time we'll need it. God willing. Oh, I also want to note that um, Sandy Gadsby has COVID. Uh, so it is a blessing that I did not have my surgery and can be here. Um, well, the downside is that you do not get John Karen moderating. Okay, you ready to drop the vote? Okay, great, let's go. The motion passes with 201 people voting yes, five negative votes, and four abstentions. We will now turn to Article 1, which asks town meeting to adopt a specialized energy code. Before we start discussing this, there are a couple of things I want to say. First, as you know, this town meeting was called on a very abbreviated schedule. And as you all know, this is a very complicated subject. I want to give very sincere thanks to the advisory committee members and especially to the subcommittee members who held hearings, absorbed this material, presented this material and presented reports and worked extremely hard over the holidays to digest and present this material to town meeting members, especially David Pollack. Uh, all of them deserve great credit for their work, especially David, and that should not be underestimated. Um, in addition, today's debate will be proceeding differently than the usual debate partly because of the uh, complicated nature of the subject matter, which requires a lot of explanation. <clears throat> we will hear from three speakers first who will be explaining the article. These will be Representative Tommy Vitolo, who was instrumental in uh, working with bringing the article through or the subject matter of the specialized energy code through the Massachusetts legislature. 
David Pollack, who was the advisory committee member responsible for presenting it to town meeting, and John Van Skoyuk, the select board member who is representing uh, and <laughs> representing the select board on this article. So in order to give adequate time for people to absorb the material in addition to the intense reading that has been done, I am going to give these speakers a block of time and basically as much time as they need. After they have finished, I will allow questions. So line up um, to ask your questions. Let Lisa Porcher, our through the chat monitor, know that you have a question and you will be called on in that order. We will not take comments, none at that time. After the questions have been gone through, I will turn to the people who have lined up to speak on this. Uh, there are not many, um, but they have indeed lined up to speak. We have, in addition to the presenters, uh, Building Commissioner Dan Bennett and Deputy Commissioner Pembroke are available to answer questions. And we will proceed now. Oh, Tommy Vitolo first. Is he present? He is in the Azores uh, and he is participating, thankfully, live. Good, good evening. It's uh, a bit after 11 p.m. where I am, but I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, I am Representative Tommy Vitolo, town meeting member at large. And as always, you can reach me by telephone at 617-872-8921 and by email at tommy.vitolo at mahouse.gov. First, uh, a quick word about why we're assembled tonight in January, 2023. If we act tonight, the specialized stretch energy code we are considering will go into effect on July 1, 2023. If we wait until the May town meeting, the earliest the code could go into effect is January 1, 2024. Simply put, we're meeting tonight because doing so allows us the opportunity to accept state language consistent with our values sooner rather than later. This concept applies to the specialized stretch energy code in Article 1, as well as the language in Article 2, just as it did when Brookline met in a special town meeting in January 2010 to join the municipal opt-in GIC, and in August 2009 to adopt the municipal opt-in meals tax and hotel tax. At that time, we thanked town meeting member Stanley Spiegel for his foresight, ensuring that the town received one additional quarter of tax revenue. Tonight, I thank town administrator Chaz Carey for his foresight in providing our town meeting the opportunity to advance a climate policy goal six months sooner. A quick reminder for Brookline to meet its self-imposed climate pollution emissions targets. For the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to comply with state law regarding climate pollution emissions targets, and for our civilization to meet emissions levels consistent with scientific consensus around avoiding dramatic climate change, we must eliminate nearly all emissions associated with burning fossil fuels at power plants, in our transportation systems, and within our buildings. We must make these reductions simultaneously. We cannot wait for a fully decarbonized electric grid to get our vehicles off gasoline or diesel or our buildings off natural gas or heating oil. Please know that grid operators and planners understand this and are actively strengthening our grid to ensure that it can indeed handle the additional requirements of electric vehicles and all electric homes and businesses. Know too that New England's electric grid is clean enough today so that all electric buildings emit less carbon pollution than those that use natural gas. 
And the net carbon benefit will get better year after year as our electric generation leaves coal, oil, and gas behind. The conversation for Warren Article 1 focuses solely on buildings, and in fact, solely on new construction. Nothing about this proposal reaches into your existing basement, your attic, or your kitchen. Furthermore, the proposal today is an interim step in the journey to decarbonizing new construction, to stop digging a deeper climate hole. I have no doubt that this town meeting will see future debate about new construction, as well as existing buildings. Before us tonight is but one step in the journey. I'd like to give a little bit of legislative history before the explanation of the technical details. I know that many people in this town meeting know the legislative history, but for the benefit of the public and for some folks newer to town meeting, I think it may be helpful. On November 20, 2019, Brookline Town Meeting voted 211 to three in favor of Warren Article 21. It would have been 212 votes in favor, but I left the Brookline High School Auditorium before the vote to return to the State House in fulfillment of my state level legislative duties. Warren Article 21, born on my part, excuse me, born on my porch as part of a conversation between myself and Jesse Gray, restricted the installation of new fossil fuel infrastructure within a newly constructed or fully renovated building, excepting for cooking and emergency generators. The idea was simple. In times of new construction or gut renovation, the choice to go fossil fuel free was far simpler and had near cost parity to gas fired HVAC systems. We knew that decarbonizing buildings not yet built would be significantly easier than already built buildings and agreed that we should take easier steps first. I'm grateful for town meeting member Gray's leadership on this issue. He filed Warren Article 21. He listened carefully to feedback from Brookline's boards and committees. He made appropriate adjustments to the original language and he shepherded it to its nearly unanimous vote. Brookline received quite a bit of praise for its cutting edge legislative efforts, but unfortunately, Article 21 never became a law. In reviewing Article 21 and all articles passed by town meeting, the Attorney General's office determined in June 2020 that Article 21 was inconsistent with three different portions of state law and therefore could not go into effect. Just a few weeks later, in recognition that state laws were made to be changed, Representative Kay Khan of Newton and I filed an amendment to the climate legislation being debated on the floor of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Our amendment called for the Department of Energy Resources, in consultation with the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, to develop a net zero municipal opt-in energy code. When the bill was finally signed by Governor Baker in March 2021, it included the Municipal Opt-in Specialized Stretch Energy Code. Like the stretch code adopted by Brookline Town Meeting in May 2010 under the leadership of Town Meeting Member Werner Lowy, only better. The Department of Energy Resources, DOER, took a full 18 months between March 2021 and October 2022 to develop the specialized stretch energy code, as well as substantial updates to the stretch code that Brookline and 300 other communities had adopted over the past 12 years. This 18 month process included numerous public meetings across the state and included input from residential and commercial real estate developers, architects, engineers, technicians, members of the building trades, property managers, university and hospital and government campus managers, electric and gas utilities, building inspectors, homeowners, tenants, and more. This code is one that we can adopt with confidence, developed carefully and publicly. I want to pause and point out Brookline's tremendous leadership on this issue. We saw a need where local action was sensible, and we developed sound regulation 
When state law needed to be changed, we did that too. And we didn't just do it for Brookline. No, we made sure every community in the Commonwealth could benefit. We drafted and passed local law, had it rejected, drafted state law, got that passed, got the necessary regulations promulgated and have come together to, I hope, accept those regulations tonight, all in the span of 38 months. That's quite remarkable. So here we are, considering a specialized stretch energy code so that new construction will have an even smaller carbon footprint than buildings that are being built today. DOER, in releasing the specialized stretch energy code several months ago, asked communities accepting the code to stick to three specifics. One, leave about six months between the announcement and implementation. This town meeting was noticed by the select board on December 20th, 2022, in excess of six months before July 1, 2023. Two, establish the effective date of the specialized stretch energy code on January 1 or July 1 of a calendar year. July 1, 2023 is indeed on July 1. Three, use DOER's Warren article template language in the local warrant, and we've done that as well. Brookline has the opportunity tonight to maintain its leadership position on local climate action by voting to enact a measured, fully vetted, targeted, effective policy. By accepting 225 CMR 22 and 23, including appendices RC and CC, Brookline will put an exclamation point on a remarkable three-year journey. A year from now, I expect we'll find that several dozen other communities representing fully one third of Massachusetts built environment will have followed our lead. In the years to follow, those numbers will surely grow. I wanna thank advisory committee member, David Pollack and select board member, John Van Skoyak, both of whom have been instrumental this past month in getting us to this point. I urge you to follow along as Mr. Pollock, a lead accredited professional architect, gives you all the juicy technical details. And then following the remarks of select board member John Van Skoyak, Q&A and further debate, I urge you to vote favorable action on the motion to accept the specialized stretch energy code effective July 1, 2023. Thank you for your time, your patience, and your belief in Brookline. Thank you. <clears throat> I now call on David Pollack. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, and to both you and Tommy for your kind words. Good evening, everyone. David Pollack, Precinct 11, speaking on behalf of the Advisory Committee. I hope that my, present, my technical presentation is accurate, and I'm relying on Building Commissioner Dan Bennett to set the record straight if necessary. The specialized energy code is an enhancement of the stretch energy code in the form of a new appendix to that regulation. The stretch code is itself an enhancement, a stretch of the base energy code for buildings. Stretch has been in force in Brookline since town meeting voted for it in 2010 and a similar majority vote tonight will add the specialized requirements for Brookline. 299 communities are already stretch. This vote will make us the first community to adopt the specialized code requirements, but certainly not the last. These are building codes. Enforcement is tied to the requirement of a building permit. Massachusetts updates its building codes on a periodic basis, typically every three years for the energy code and every six years for the building code. And that's anticipated for later in 2023. So this is a big year for code updates. That's particularly important to understand because a lot of the changes to the energy code are in the updates to the stretch energy code and not in the specialized code before town meeting tonight. So I'm gonna be spending some time explaining those updates to the stretch code as I'm walking you through the details of the specialized code. The first of all these regular building code updates to go into effect 
was the new version of the stretch code for low rise residential buildings. That's single family, two family and townhomes. That is already in force as of January 1st, 2023, 10 days ago. <clears throat> Here at a high level are the highlights of what's new in the updated stretch code uh, for one and two family dwellings that just went into effect. For existing homes, there are now requirements for big additions and major renovations. So if you build an addition on your home over a thousand square feet in the addition, and also a, a level three alteration that think gut renovation, major changes to more than 50% of a home, it needs to meet an energy efficiency standard in the form of a maximum HERS rating. HERS, that's H-E-R-S, stands for Home Energy Rating System, and a lower score is better. The standards for major renovations and large additions are not as stringent as for new homes. For new homes, there, are, there already were HERS requirements, and the new, as of January 1st, slightly lower HERS requirements uh, in contrast to December 31st. In addition, the stretch code requires two things. Um, it requires new homes to be pre-wired for electric vehicles, for EV, um, doesn't need the plugs, but it needs to pre be pre-wired, and it needs energy recovery ventilation. So that's all in the stretch code, not what we're voting on. So what are we voting on? What added requirements are in the specialized code for low-rise residential? And here I'm hoping my first slide can be put up. Great, so the three slides I'm gonna show you are from a Department of Energy, uh, uh, regular, uh, excuse me, um, DOER um, talk that was put together and that was distributed to town meeting, but that was put together on no, this past November 2nd. So um, first, for renovations and additions, we're not voting on anything tonight. This, this is really important. The, the specialized code is about new construction, nothing about renovations and additions. And that's in the last line on the slide. It says, same as stretch code, which, which is already in effect. Um, so if you live in a single family, a two family, a townhouse, any question you might ask tonight about how this vote affects a project you might wanna do has the same answer. It has no effect, no additional requirements, nothing. For new dwelling units of any size, if they're all electric, that's all that's required. End of story. This is a thematic to the specialized code. It's pushing towards building electrification. So for any size new home or dwelling, if you make it electric, that's all that's in specialized. There is also a mixed fuel pathway, a fossil fuel pathway, not only for new dwelling units, single family, for all building projects. And uh, so if you want a gas stove in your new home, a gas boiler, you can have it. For mixed fuel homes under 4,000 square feet, you can follow the middle pathway on this slide. You have to achieve a HERS score of 42, now that's a very efficient building that's also written into the stretch code. It gets rolled in uh, gradually, so it doesn't hit the 42 until July 1st of 2024, but in, in, in 18 months from now, it's stretch and specialized. They both have that same requirement. That's just stretch 42. And if you do mixed fuel, you have to do two things. You have to pre-wire now for future electrical equipment, and you have to put solar panels on the roof to the extent practical. If you wanna have fossil fuels, you need to do pre-wiring for electric and solar panels in a new dwelling that's up to 4,000 square feet. For mixed fuel homes bigger than 4,000 square feet, 
they need to be net zero. If you have fossil fuel burning, you need to be net zero. Now, this is a little detailed, but there are two pathways. It's interesting, though. There are two pathways. There's something called HERS zero, and there's something called uh, passive FIAS zero or passive house zero. For HERS zero, you need to meet that same HERS 42, and then you need to have enough solar panels to offset all the energy that you're using on the site so you have a net zero building, which is, which is very cool. If you do FIAS zero, you're actually allowed both on-site and off-site renewables. So you don't have to do it all with solar panels. And the off-site renewables are discounted. There, there's an adjustment factor. But at any rate, you can, get, you can satisfy the net zero without uh, doing everything with solar panels if your roof's not big enough. But what's clear in this large home requirement, over 4,000 square feet, is that the easy pathway is just to be all electric. You can, you can have mixed fuel, but um, if, you, you know, if you put a heat pump in, which is what most people are doing in new homes, and you put a fancy induction range in the kitchen, you don't really have an issue. You can just do all electric, or you can do the net zero. How big is 4,000 square feet? That's, that's pretty big. Um, uh, I used to live in a four bedroom condo over by Amory Street, and that was 1,800 square feet. That's less than half the size of 4,000. So I, I think if you wanna know how big a 4,000 square foot home is, you should think the bigger homes on Fisher Hill, not, not the smaller homes, they would be less than that, but the bigger homes on Fisher Hill, 4,000 or five or six or whatever. Okay, next slide, please. So next we're gonna do, uh, let's, uh, the slide before, isn't there one before this? Sorry, I thought there were, ooh, is there a third or do you only have two slides? Yeah, this is, this is what I'm looking for. Sorry, I put them out of order. Um, so for commercial buildings, not including multifamily, because multifamily is controlled in the commercial stretch code, but it, it, it's got separate requirements. So for non-residential commercial buildings, first, and this is a theme, there aren't requirements in the specialized code for alterations, for renovations. Once again, it's only the new construction. All of the requirements for renovation, all of the requirements for renovation, for alteration, are in the stretch code. And the stretch code for commercial buildings goes into effect on July 1st of this year. So um, there are some changes in the stretch code uh, that are chat, you know, that are significant, just like in the residential. Um, there's a they cover all buildings, not just buildings bigger than 100,000 square feet. Um, they have also have an EV ready parking requirement, just like the residential code. And there are a bunch of new energy conservation requirements like air leakage testing, energy recovery ventilation. So for stretch code, it's upping the ante for, uh, for commercial buildings. But that's not what we're voting on. What we're voting on, the specialized code, is quite simple. Like with low-rise residential, there are three pathways. If it's all electric, end of story. There's an optional passive house pathway. Passive house is an energy efficiency certification program, and I'll tell you a little more about that a little later on. And there's a mixed fuel pathway for new projects that they require pre-wiring for electric uh, uh, machines later, and they require solar on-site where feasible. So mixed fuel, it's the same. You just have to pre-wire and do solar to the extent feasible, and that's it in the mixed fuel pathway. For commercial additions that are bigger than 100% of the existing building, so if you double the size of a commercial building or the addition is bigger than 20,000 square feet, then 
they have to follow the specialized code, which basically means pick one of these three pathways here. And that's only for the addition, not for the building that's being doubled in size. So that's it. Uh, for new construction or additions bigger than the existing building or bigger than 20,000 square feet, they need to be all electric or need to pre they need to pre-wire and have solar panels. That's what we're voting on. That's what we're voting on in relation to commercial buildings. So now that, that, uh, that middle slide about uh, multifamily, please. Thanks. Um, so uh, what do we, so, so multifamily buildings have a real change and it's only new, it's not renovations, it's not additions, but for multifamily buildings bigger than 12,000 square feet, which might be, you know, uh, anything bigger than whatever, it could be six really big apartments or uh, eight apartments or 10 apartments or condos, you know, buildings bigger than that, that are bigger, they need to meet the passive house standard. Passive house is a highly energy efficient building standard that also promotes indoor comfort and acoustic insulation. Passive house certification requires knowledgeable architects and engineers, as well as a certified passive house consultant. Uh, it also has the same EV charging requirement as the stretch code and the roof needs to be ready for solar panels. That comes along with, uh, with, with the, the, the passive house. Um, passive house does not require net zero, and it doesn't require fossil fuel free. It requires a very low energy use building. Uh, while passive house is relatively, relatively new to Massachusetts, there were over 140 projects on the path to certification of as, la as of last summer, according to a Massachusetts Clean Energy Center publication, and Brookline's Housing Authority's Colonel Floyd Apartments on Marion Street is one of those projects in the, in the pipeline. So boiling it down, uh, all of it, including low rise residential, commercial and multifamily, there's really just three things to know. The stretch code, which we're not voting on, but which is getting more demanding, has a bunch of upgrades for efficiency, adds the electric vehicle pre-wiring requirement for new buildings, um, and all of that, is based on our vote from 2010. In the special, the specialized code pushes hard for electrification of new buildings, but allows a mixed fuel pathway for new buildings with additional requirements and multifamily buildings have to meet passive house. Now, the discussion advisory committee and public comment at AC subcommittee were generally strongly in support of this bylaw. The reality of the climate crisis and the fact that the, this code is the reflection of town meetings 2019 action and now returning as statewide regulation were cited. Where concerns were raised, they related to the following challenges. First, while the grid is more than halfway to being carbon free, and there's a legislative mandate to move that number forward by 3% per year for the next five years, there is still a lot of uncertainty and a long way to go to get to zero carbon grid. And second, while these codes move us in the right direction for new construction, we know that 80% of our buildings in 2050, when we're supposed to be net zero, will be buildings that are already in existence today. And we don't have a plan for making those buildings energy efficient and fossil fuel free. Likewise, we have a long way to go to get to zero carbon with our cars and trucks. The article before you has been amended according to the recommendations of town council, and these amendments are considered administrative. The advisory committee recommends favorable action on Warren Article 1 as amended by a vote of 17 in favor, one opposed with three abstentions. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Van Skoyak, you are up. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, my name is John Van Skoyak, uh, and I'm Vice Chair of the Select Board. And tonight I will be speaking on behalf of the Select Board, and I'm grateful to be speaking after David Pollack and Representative Vitolo. 
their, remar their remarks um, save me <laughs> the, uh, the trouble of uh, going extra minutes with my speech. This one's gonna be short. I'm also grateful to Representative Vitolo for truly pulling a rabbit out of the hat. Just six months ago, after Brookline's local bylaw restricting fossil fuel infrastructure in new construction and major renovation was ruled inconsistent with state law, the legislature rectified the inconsistency, codifying the municipal opt-in specialized stretch energy code in state law. Without Representative Atolo's advocacy on behalf of the town during his first term in office, we would not be here today. And thank you also to town administrator Chaz Carey, who embraced this night of town meeting when town staff and the select board are hard at work putting together multiple budgets for the coming fiscal year. And thank you to my colleagues on the select board for their flexibility and willingness to add this town meeting to their plate at a time when our plates are full. And I'm also grateful to our building inspectors who work tirelessly to ensure that our buildings are safe, efficient, and built to code. I know that the updated stretch code we already have is gonna require more effort from our inspectors, but I'm hopeful that by adopting the specialized stretch energy code, we can alleviate some of the added work because under the specialized stretch, new buildings won't typically have gas plumbing to inspect at all. Brookline has a long history of being on the forefront of environmental issues. And we know that every single building must be decarbonized within the next 20 years or so. Every building that we get right today is one fewer building that will face a more disruptive and costly retrofit within our lifetimes. Here in Brookline, we are eager to do what we can to mitigate climate change. Unfortunately, the federal and state government do not give us many tools for the fight. The specialized stretch energy code is one tool that we do have, and given our town's history, I believe we have an obligation to, to use it. And I ask that you join a unanimous select board in voting yes on Warrant Article 1. Thank you very much. Mr. Van Squack, we have a question from Susie Roberts. Ms. Roberts? You're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, hold on one second so I can put on my. Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. Um, I had asked this question at the advisory committee meeting um, before, both at the, uh, I think it was actually at the main advisory committee meeting because it had been mentioned in the subcommittee. Um, and it doesn't relate to the um, technical technical aspects of the specialized code. It more relates to a question about the effect of our uh, town meeting tonight voting in favor towards when the effective date would be for any approval of the specialized uh, stretch code. And that related to a question of Ms. Roberts? Ms. Roberts? You're breaking yes. up, so could you please turn off your, okay, okay. could you please start over because you were breaking up and I don't want to miss any of your question. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, my, my question relates to um, the timing of when the specialized stretch code would be adopted, whether it's in July or whether it's next January. And I had asked the question actually of Kara Bruton when we uh, had a meeting of the advisory committee last week, and it relates to 40B and the economic feasibility analyses that are uh, those who have 40B applications in right now or who have been approved for um, a comprehensive permit and are waiting to construct their buildings, whether or not 
adoption of the specialized stretch code would require uh, or necessitate these projects, many of these projects uh, sort of reevaluating their economic feasibility with the possibility that we would not be able to count them in our SHI and therefore would go under the 10% threshold. Um, and I wanted to raise the question again here and hopefully Kara will answer it um, as well for the full town meeting as well as for advisory. I do think it's important that, you know, what we're dealing with here is a question of timing and when we're going to adopt the specialized stretch code. My guess is that we probably will adopt it, whether it's now or whether it's in May, I don't know, but I think it's important for everyone to understand um, whether the timing would affect any 40B projects falling off our SHI so that we then fall under the 10%. So um, I would love it if uh, the moderator would um, ask that the question be answered. Um, and I appreciate the time. Thank you. I, I will ask Ms. Bruton, but with one um, addition. Um, the motion as written has an effective date as of July 1st, 2023. That cannot be changed. There is no amendment to change that date. So absent some action to change that effective date, that is when it would go into effect. So uh, Ms. Bruton, keeping that date in mind, the question is how would that effective date impact 40Bs that are currently in line um, or underway that have been applications that have been filed, et cetera. Good evening, uh, moderator. Uh, my name is Kara Bruton. I'm the director of planning community development. <clears throat> um, I'm more than happy to repeat my answer for all of town meeting um, to hear as I stated at advisory. Um, so the consensus opinion of both town council, building department, and our department is that the specialized code, if adopted, would apply at the time an applicant applies for a building permit. Um, we, do not net, we do not yet know to what extent the specialized code would have a financial impact on multifamily projects beyond other building code changes that are um, currently happening as we speak, as well as changing market conditions. Um, we have reached out to the development community, asking them to let us know to the extent they are able. And from what we've heard to date, they're still trying to figure that out. <clears throat> As David Pollack mentioned at advisory, our nonprofit multifamily developers are seeking passive house standards, um, which you can uh, equate to um, specialized code for multifamily for the sake of tonight. Um, they're doing they're seeking that status already. And part of the basis for that decision is that they receive additional points when competing for available state funding. So that's for kind of the nonprofit world. Most of the 40B developers that have received a building permit have requested some modification to their permit for a variety of reasons. So you know, independent of the specialized code question, um, this is due to construction drawings being developed, um, financial feasibility is reevaluated, so what we've seen when this happens is those 40B projects temporarily fall off the state housing inventory um, when they do not receive a building permit within 12 months of the 40B approval. In fact, to date, we've only had one 40B project team receive a building permit in that 12 month window. It is very rare. Um, these projects do return to the inventory once a building permit is issued by the building department. Additionally, the updated 2020 year round housing census number is not scheduled to be released until this coming May. So given the changing construction costs, financial market conditions, the unknown 2020 housing, housing unit number, <clears throat> and the usual delay in time period for 40B applicants to develop construction documents and receive a building permit, and then also taking a look at um, how fast 40B projects are likely to move forward that are kind of in the queue, um, getting ready to pull their building permit documents together. I believe it is quite possible that the town could fall under the 10% threshold in the second half of this year. 
independent of whether or not the town votes the specialized code tonight. If the town were to dip below the 10% threshold, we would likely see a handful of additional 40B applications until one of the temporary or permanent so-called safe harbor thresholds are reached. And what, so what that means is we would see likely, you know, three or four 40B projects be um, uh, get started th this fall. And then as those start to come online with various stages, we would be once again above our 10%. So in short, I don't think um, from what the information that we have tonight that voting on the specialized code one way or the other um, will affect the um, whether or not we're at our 10% <clears throat> for the state's counting of the um, housing index. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. We have a question from Jonathan Davis. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm Jonathan Davis, Precinct 17. Uh, what is to prevent the DOER from later amending the specialized okay, code Mr. Davis, you're, or you're the stretch code you're to import? Could you, uh, Mr. Davis, I will. Could you turn yes, off your video, please? I did. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Davis, Precinct 17. Uh, what is to prevent the DOER from later uh, amending the specialized code or the stretch code to import uh, new construction, its new construction rules for multifamily into renovations of existing multifamily? Mr. Vitolo? Representative Tommy Vitolo, town meeting member at large. Uh, I'll get a stab at this, but I, I wonder if Dan Bennett may also uh, chime in on the history of the BBRS and, and the way they go about um, designing building codes with DOER. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything to prevent them from doing it except all of history and um, the demands of a general population that would rightfully so be furious uh, with such a move, right? The building code relates to, um, the, the philosophy behind the building code is not to go into your home and require you to adjust the stairs to meet modern standards, to adjust the insulation or the windows in your walls to meet modern standards and so forth. Um, if it had every single structure in our town, save one built in the last three years, would require work every three years. And that's just an untenable situation, frankly, a, an absurd one um, that, that just doesn't match the way a functioning society is likely to go. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear um, if Mr. Bennett um, has any thoughts about uh, how the building code is promulgated every three years and the philosophy behind reaching into uh, existing structures that aren't being substantially modified, modified and applying uh, a building code to those structures. Mr. Bennett. Good evening, Dan Bennett, Building Commissioner. Uh, for the most part, I think to Tommy's point and uh, uh, the, the, the questioner, um, they really don't reach into you know, the homes of, of any particular people. Um, or individual units. What they are looking for is the overall, you know, impact of the building with respect to life safety, uh, structural issues. It's it's more all encompassing of the entire building and not specifically, you know, unit to unit, outside of life safety things and and and, um, and stairways and railings and, and and those types of things. But uh, you know, between the DOER and the BBRS. Um, you know, I would hope that there would be a, a open line of communication between the two and that they both understand the position that each uh, agency is in to try to, um, you know, help, um, you know, with building design and uh, energy efficiencies and life safety and structure. Um, so I, I, I really don't envision um, um, that happening, but I guess the, the the outside chance, if it was something that was so drastic that people didn't like, uh, the town, you know, would always possibly have the option of getting out of it, you know, voting to, 
to, to not get into the specialized code and, and stick with just the stretch code until the changes could be made down the road at the legislative level to indicate why they're doing it. Uh, Nancy Heller. Okay. We're thank you. For you to... okay, I, great. Thank you. I should probably turn my video off just so I, my bandwidth isn't uh, so badly affected. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. Nancy Heller, Precinct 8. Uh, first of all, I heartily support this measure. I do think it's very important that as we move forward, um, we find ways to um, make sure our um, our residences are electrified. What bothers me about the provision on the new uh, residences is that it's for 4,000 square feet or less. And as David Pollack said, that's huge. That's a huge house. Um, and in Brookline, I don't know how many we have, but I do know that in North Brookline, where there is some condo development going on, the condos are in the range of say two or 3,000 square feet. So I'm disturbed that we are going to miss those. And I'm wondering whether the town will have the option to change that particular number of 4,000 square feet to a lower number, an amendment, if you will, our, own, our very own amendment, or whether that's so mandated by the state that we cannot do anything about it. Mr. Vitolo. Representative Tommy Vitolo, town meeting member at large. I want to address two different parts um, of Ms. Heller's question. Uh, to clarify, and, and if I don't get this exactly right, I would encourage Mr. Pollack to chime in. The specialized stretch energy code applies to both residences below 4,000 square feet and greater than or equal to 4,000 square feet. The distinction is that for the mega houses, for the, for the mansions, for the 4,000 square feet and up, there are additional requirements because if you can afford a 4,000 square foot massive home, you can afford to do a little bit more for the climate today. So I, just to be very clear, uh, the Specialized Stretch Energy Code absolutely applies to new construction for residences below 4,000 square feet and greater than or equal to 4,000 square feet. To answer the detail of your question, um, municipalities have no ability to modify the specialized stretch energy code in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and so we have to do all of it or none of it. Now, that may change in the future because Brookline is one of the 10 towns. You may recall we had a home rule petition that although I and my colleagues were not able to pass as a home rule petition or able to get included in climate legislation um, that we passed into law at the same time the specialized stretch code was passed into law. And that provision allows 10 municipalities, including Brookline, to push the ball even farther up court. I'm channeling my inner Maura Healy on this one, uh, our newly elected and sworn in governor, uh, so that we in Brookline may, as soon as this may, um, be able to modify the specialized stretch energy code to make it even more aggressive. Now, that is not on the table today. That is still being hashed out. Um, but it, I want to be clear, it is possible in the future that our town meeting may have the ability to vote to make the specialized stretch code even more aggressive by restricting the mixed fuels pathway. Uh, but that is not on the table today. On the table today is all or nothing, effective July 1, 2023. Do we want the specialized stretch energy code up or down? I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benka, you have a question and I will determine to whom it is directed. Thank you.
Are they talking? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Pollock, uh, Dick Benko, Precinct 14. Um, going to your slide regarding multifamily larger buildings, uh, could you please explain what the options were for six plus stories, or maybe perhaps it was five plus stories? It was choose TEDI or PERS 4245 or ASHRAE App Appendix G. And then I have a follow-up question to that. Okay, Mr. Pollack. Uh, if, if you could just respond. explain what, what those codes mean. I'm hoping Building Commissioner Bennett can come up to the plate on this one, uh, on this these technical, uh, technical requirements. Part of that was... Um, that was also short term, that distinction between under five stories and above six. That's just until next year as it's it's part of the roll in. But in and then the TEDI is a whole new, you know, measurement uh, basically to it's a system for um, getting uh, engineers and architects to uh, make better buildings. Uh, but I don't know, Dan, hopefully Dan Bennett can. Mr. Pollock, could you put this, the, um, it might be helpful if you put the slide back up. Yep, it's gotta happen on your end, um, Madam Moderator, but yeah. Just a subsidiary, okay, then... Ma Madam Moderator, a subsidiary question to that is, does an all electric building, will a building that is all electric satisfy um, one of these, or do these code requirements require something more beyond that? They require a lot more. A passive house is a, is a demanding standard that requires a pre-certification of the design and then follow through throughout the construction process. And at the end of the construction process, it, it either requires certification by FIAS, the Passive House Institute of the US, and there is actually in the detail of the regulation, and that's a certificate of occupancy, you need certification. But if for some reason certification is held up, uh, a developer can submit all the paperwork for certification directly to the building department and say, we did it all and we don't have, you know, so you don't, you're not technically dependent on the Institute for their certificate, but you still have to do the full certification. So. Meeting passive house is not just electrification. It's a bunch more. I, for, it's, it wasn't for this slide. multifamily projects. Is this the correct slide? It is not. There you go. There we go. There we go. It's the second bullet. And, and David has answered one of my questions. My follow-up question to David and to the building commissioner would be, do we have any idea at all? I know Ms. Bruton was not able to provide an answer. Do we have any idea at all what the cost of this would add to market rate multifamily residential, or would it necessitate increasing the scale of 40B developments okay, in order Bennett. to meet their financial standards? Mr. Bennett, could you address this uh, to the extent you are able? Can you, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Banker, Dan Bennett, Building Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Banker, can you repeat that question? The, the question is, what does, what does the second bullet mean? And the related question is, do we have any idea at all what this would add to the cost of market rate multifamily residential developments or, would it, or with regard to 40Bs, would it necessitate increasing the size and scale of 40Bs in order for them to meet their financial requirements. So, so I, I don't have any idea of the cost of a building. I haven't seen any real uh, comparisons. Back in 2009 and 10, when the stretch energy code was you know, front and, and center, there were a lot of analysis done out there as to what the cost of the, the home would be, the savings, the energy savings. There was, there was a lot of that. I haven't seen anything um, on, from DOER on on this code and what those um, 
impacts are. Um, with respect to a 40B project, uh, and this is the issue that's kind of still, uh, I'll say in limbo, more legal limbo than anything is because the 40B projects, um, if, if they are required, and I, I, I lean towards the fact that they are required to have to comply with these codes because the permit application hasn't been received, um, and they make an argument that the property or the building, the, the project is now uneconomic, they might be able to come back to the town and, and, and adjust something. Um, whether the town you know, agrees with that or doesn't agree with that remains to be seen. That's something that could happen you know, in the future. Um, so it, 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 you know, I'm gonna guess that however Brookline moves forward on this, one of our 40B developers is going to contact the HAC or you know someone at the state to get an interpretation or a determination um, as to whether or not this these do or don't apply to um, you know 40B projects. Um, in re with respect to your, I think question you're talking about the, the second bullet here, passive house required for all residences, residential over 12,000 square feet. What that does is that directs you to the passive house um, criteria uh, in the uh, stretch code um, uh, 407. And you've got a thermal energy demand intensity limit that you would have to follow as well as all of the passive house criteria um, that is there. Um, I'm sorry, that's for the six stories or more. Um, is that what you were asking about the second? He, he was asking what's the difference between TEDI, HERS 42, 45, and ASHRAE. I don't, I don't know those those specifics. I mean, each those are each separate sections of the code. Uh, the TDI, you know, from what I have here, is it's a performance modeling uh, that shows the building heating, thermal energy demand intensity, and cooling so, um, systems are, are less than or equal to the values in this table. This would all be done by engineers. It'd be modeling stuff that's done, um, you know, outside of my department uh, by the engineers when they submit their application, and there would be additional, you know, testing, uh, performance standards, and other modeling that we would, you know, get from uh, these design engineers. This is a, this 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 would be high level, and um, you know, Brookline has a lot of these buildings, you know, in in the queue. But I wouldn't say that this these these types of buildings would be the norm um, um, for the for the short term. And as as these developers and um, um, different um, construction groups figure this out, I think it'll get easier uh, for them and for us as we try to you know move forward through this um, this code process. You're unmuted. Hello, um, Linda Olson Pelkey, town meeting member, precinct 17. Just following up on the multifamily, um, what David told us in that slide shows is that the passive house standard is applicable above 12,000 square feet. But I think we should also um, tell town meeting what the standards are going to be for multifamily that is less than 12,000 square feet, but has more units than two. Is that relevant to the new specialized stretch code? I'm gonna wait till somebody tells me if it is or not. Mr. Pollock, is that relevant to the new specialized stretch code? or is it something that relates to the existing stretch code? I'm not sure of the answer. I mean, because it's very clear, larger than 12,000 square feet. Um, the, the uh, you know, I don't know if Dan's gotten to the bottom of this yet. Um, the 
multifamily is regulated under chapter 225 CMR chapter 23. In other words, we're talking two codes here, the, re the residential low rise, one family, two family and townhomes, and then the commercial code, but multifamily is in the commercial code. And the specialized speaks directly to, to larger than 12,000. I don't think it says anything about smaller than 12,000. So my guess is that uh, specialized has no requirements specific to multifamily below 12,000 square feet. Uh, Mr. Bennett, do you have any comment on that? It, it, it would apply, there are statements as to whether it applies to one or two family units, isn't that correct? Uh, yes, um, this, is, this is the specialized, right? Yeah, okay. So, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm referring to the table and what happens in this code, which is a little different than our regular codes, is they talk about dwelling units over a certain size, and then they talk about buildings of a certain size. So you can kind of get mixed and a little confused. And I, I think if Linda's question, she was asking, if, if you have dwelling units that are greater than 4,000 square feet, you could do an all electric building and follow criteria, and you could do a mixed fuel building and follow certain criteria that is in the specialized code. It goes, it would kick over to the residential uh, code in that, in that case. Okay, thank you. Um, Susie Roberts, you have a comment? Oh, I'm sorry. We are only allowing questions at this point. So unless it's a question, we will move on to the other people who have asked to speak. So, um, because we have no other people who are lined up to ask questions, so you will wait in line at this point. Um, however, other people who have questions may contact the chat monitor. Um, Jesse Gray, you are speaking on behalf of Ziab, I believe. That's correct, Jesse Gray, town meeting member, precinct 10, and chair of the Zero Emissions Advisory Board, Ziab, speaking for Ziab as well as for myself, Ziab, recommends favorable action on warrant article one by a vote of five to zero with zero abstentions. I'd like to use my time to talk about some of the values embedded in this code, stepping back a little bit from all the details that we've heard. This warrant article is a culmination of many of our community's values, including hard work, teamwork, climate action, and even fiscal responsibility. You all know my commitment to climate action. But what you may not know about me is that even though an ex-girlfriend did regularly accuse me of being a robot, I do <laughs> actually care about a lot of other things. I really do. And one thing I care about, one thing I love is working with people toward a common goal. The work that we did together on Warrant Article 21 in the fall of 2019 to ban fossil fuels and new construction ultimately led us to this stretch energy code. I have witnessed how to achieve big, important policy change. And I am humbled by how many of you devote endless hours toward making the world a better place. Creating a better Brookline takes a willingness to work with people with whom you don't necessarily agree a willingness to build trust and respect, and an ability to maintain civility at all times. It is a testament to the hard work and teamwork that we did together that we now have an uncontroversial building code that balances the environment, housing production, and fiscal responsibility, the bottom dollar. I wanna thank everybody who helped us get here to this moment tonight and I'm honored to have been part of this team. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harry Friedman. Good 
to Madam Moderator. Harry Friedman, Precinct 12, member of advisory, is speaking tonight for myself in opposition to Warrant Article 1. I was not planning to speak, but assumed I might be the only no vote on this and wanted to explain my reasons, because I do have legitimate reasons for opposing this. After the advisory subcommittee met, I read its report on the warrant article. I then sat through the full advisory meeting. After pondering a bit, I realized I didn't understand much of what the article would impose. After reading comments on the listserv, I realized I wasn't alone. The warrant article will impose additional conditions to what we have under the current stretch code. These new requirements will impose costs on both builders and on the town. What and how much are unclear. Several advisory members mentioned their own experience of what I will call the Brookline surcharge. This is the additional amount builders and contracts add to their bids when they do work in our town. Whether it's because we are viewed as a wealthy community ripe for the picking, or a community with abstruse building regulations, or a community that is particularly strict in enforcing its regulations, or some combination thereof, this surcharge exists. Warrant Article 1 will only add to the surcharge by adding new regulations with which builders are unfamiliar. We will be the outlier. And in the world of business, that's not a good thing. Vendors will tack on additional charges to cover this. In addition, Warrant Article 1 will increase enforcement costs to our building department as they are forced to staff up and train to deal with the new regulations. This is an additional cost to the town's taxpayers, whether or not they are involved with any new construction. The new requirements imposed by Warrant Article 1 are also new to the Commonwealth. It will take time to devise guidance and regulations. Early adopters will bear the brunt of costs, delays, and general headaches associated with this ramp up, and our building department threatens to become overwhelmed. What's the rush? Several of the energy saving features of the new specialized code just move up by a year, requirements that will already be imposed by our current stretch code in July of 2024. There's no need to be the first municipality to sign on. Lewis and Clark gained renown for charting a route from Missouri to the Pacific Northwest, but the trip was much easier for those who followed after them. It's not always easy or particularly wise to be the pioneer. I don't believe there's anything intrinsically bad about the proposed specialized code, but we're diving into uncharted waters. We can give this time. Let the state and some other municipality figure out all the kinks. Then we can look at it with our eyes wide open. This thing hit during the holidays. The advisory subcommittee had to schedule a meeting between Christmas and New Year's Day. Some members couldn't attend. Representatives from the building department were unable to attend both the subcommittee meeting and the full advisory hearing on January 2. Questions are still being raised by town meeting members to which there are no answers. Again, what's the rush? Why are we doing this now? Given all we know and don't know, I believe the reasonable thing at this point in time is to vote this down until all costs and implications become at least somewhat clearer. Please vote no. This can always be raised again at the next town meeting or the town meeting after that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lowy. Werner Lowy. Oh, you one moment. the wrong person. This is David Lowe. You're unmuted. There is a no, not David Lowe. Werner Lowe. There is a motion to call the question, which I am not considering. Don't even try for a while. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Uh, I'm Werner Lowe. I'm town meeting member from Precinct 13, and I'm also a member of the Zero Emissions Advisory Board. Um, I, I particularly want to address uh, Mr. Friedman's comment, but before I before I do that, uh, let me say that. You know, we've all heard tonight that back in 2010, Brookline was an early adopter of the original stretch code. So really this now is the next logical step to ad adopt the specialized stretch code. It's completely consistent with statewide plans in that 
later this year, as, as uh, Representative Vitolo said, uh, the State Department of Energy Resources um, is likely to be working with us, almost certainly to be working with us and nine other communities on a pilot program to go 100% fossil fuel free. Uh, in, in fact, DOER has actively encouraged us and those communities to adopt this special uh, specialized press code first in preparation for that next step of going 100% fossil fuel free. Uh, but to, to address Mr. Friedman's comment, what I want to really emphasize is how important it is that we do this right now. You know, of course, uh, the main reason is that climate change won't wait, but uh, time flies. You know, it, was, it was back in 2019 uh, that this really started when Jesse Gray took the first steps. That was a long time ago, and we need to keep up the momentum. But, but the second reason, um, and this has already been said, but it, it needs to be reemphasized. Although many people advocated for this, the single person in the state legislature who deserves the most credit for this becoming law is Tommy Vitolo. We want to be one of the very first towns to adopt this, because in doing that, we're not only acknowledging Tommy's work on this, but we're also supporting him in future legislative work on climate change issues. So please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ernest Fry. You have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Ernie Fry, Precinct 7. All the town meeting members, I exchanged correspondence today with Building Commissioner Bennett and Jonathan Simpson of the Town Council's office regarding this article. I thank them for their um, speedy responses. My concern was that we are voting on a policy strongly recommended by the state on a subject that has general support from any reasonable individual who is conscious of the long-term effects of climate change on planet Earth. There is no question this article garnering will garner overwhelming support from this body. Considerable resources have been expended by town staff, the select board, advisory committee, town meeting members in trying to understand the ramifications of this article. All of this effort is much appreciated. Is there another way this matter could have been considered? I was informed that the town has relied on longstanding guidance from the Department of Energy Resources and the Board of Building Regulations and Standards which has stated a municipality needs to initially adopt these two specialized codes. These regulations are very technical, most understood by those running building departments. I must assume there has been strong representative to the DOER and the BDRS from the building and planning departments from various towns, possibly even Brookline, so that they generally agree that they are appropriate. If they have not been agreed to by these experts, who we are entrusted to supporting this generally accepted policy, then I suggest the regulations are being proposed prematurely. If there is general agreement to these policies, the DOER and BDRS should be able to mandate their adoption as a statewide policy through legislative action at the state level if necessary, to have individual towns decide whether to opt in or out of these regulations seems inappropriate to me. Given that this article should get overwhelming support after a discussion of probably two hours tonight, I suggest that we take the opportunity to approve a call of the question as soon as the moderator has decided we have sufficient understanding of the issue. This suggestion differs from the usual action I have taken in the past on this motion, but in this case, I believe we should rely on the moderator's judgment. Many citizens of the town, many town meeting members have bemoaned that our representative town meeting is slow and strenuous as, and that another structure should be considered. It is articles such as this one with expected overwhelming support that lead to this conclusion. I implore my fellow town meeting members who are considering drafting a warrant article for future town meetings to carefully consider whether that proposed article deserves all the town resources and those of the select board, advisory committee, and subcommittee 
and town committee that must be expended to deliver that article. I welcome further comment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Rebecca Mountner. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Mountner. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 11. Um, I'd like to address the concerns that have been raised um, on the listserv and this evening that adopting this Warren article might possibly have a chilling effect on the creation of affordable housing. Um, as many of you know, I work in the field of affordable housing and have spent the past 25 years developing affordable housing throughout the Commonwealth. And at this point, what is in the specialized code is basically what is required, um, as Mr. Pollock said, to, by the state and public funders to create affordable housing in most municipalities across the, the state. At this, um, almost all new construction is passive house and new affordable housing in Boston is required to meet the net zero standard. This is because over the past five years, the key funders of affordable housing have made high levels of energy efficiency a requirement for creating new affordable housing. All architects who create and renovate affordable housing are gaining fluency in this area. They actually will not be selected for new projects and their businesses will shut down if they do not become proficient in passive house and net zero design. Every affordable housing developer in the Commonwealth is gaining expertise in designing and building to passive house standards. We have to in order to stay in business. The speed with which our field has evolved is a testament to how quickly we can adapt to make changes needed to address the climate crisis. As Jesse Gray once said, as the climate crisis accelerates, so too will our ability to adapt. This is one area where it is really evident. I will be candid here and tell you that five years ago, none of us would have believed this was possible. It has been truly inspiring to see how quickly we can adapt when we decide to. To respond to Mr. Benkin's, Benka's specific question about the cost impact of the requirements of the specialized code, code, I personally have worked on analyzing the impact of adding passive house requirements to numerous affordable housing projects. In general, when the stretch code is in effect, as it is in Brookline, passive house generally adds two to 3% to the construction cost. I've analyzed this in several projects and we have consistently found it is truly a negligible impact on the project's financial feasibility. It does not lead to greater density or scale. To respond to Ms. Roberts' comment earlier today, any developer planning to create, and on the listserv, any developer planning to create new construction in Brookline over the last few years should have anticipated that we would have our building code to the standard as soon as possible and should have designed their proposed plan to incorporate these provisions. Any, excuse me, anyone developing or thinking about developing real estate in Brookline knew or should have known that we would develop, adopt these building code requirements that required enhanced energy efficiency, at least after the fall of 2019 when we adopted the fossil fuel free warrant article. You have the Massachusetts. Sure. The building code is updated periodically, and everyone in our business knows this and contemplates it and adjusts their plans accordingly. I was at a meeting a few weeks ago reviewing projects and what would need to be revised in light of the new building code. Anyone, any developer who failed to design or plan for anticipated changes in the building code do so at their own peril. The affordable housing community in Massachusetts has aligned around the principle that any new construction should meet the standards of the specialized code. I am very heartened and, and pleased to think that within a few, hour, a few minutes or hours, Brookline will join this Commonwealth-wide Commonwealth approach and adopt Warrant Article 1. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's been a motion uh, to call the question. There are a few more people who have questions, so I'm going to allow those uh, before I will consider the motion to call the question. Uh, Kate Silba, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I support this, of course. Um, 
but I, my question really, and I, and I'm with, sorry, could you introduce yourself? Sorry. So I'm a town meeting member from precinct one. Um, my question really just goes to why we're, we're here tonight. I have been in town meeting for a long time. Uh, in the past, when we've gone off cycle, it's been because there was a particular timing issue, like a deadline to access state building funds on the state's timetable to settle a litigation, to pull money off the table that won't be there if we wait, um, to complete a union negotiation or so forth. And I just am trying to understand what we've heard, um, but it doesn't sound to me like that's this situation. Um, what I heard about why we're here for an off cycle meeting is that the sponsors are incredibly enthusiastic about our newfound ability to do this. And the sooner we pass it, the sooner it will be implemented, which I believe is the condition of every warrant article. Um, and so I'm, I'm just troubled by the precedent this meeting sets. Um, and if it weren't about climate change, I'd be troubled enough to vote against it. But of course, I'm going to vote for it. Um, uh, but I just don't think town meeting should be called into session right now on the basis of the fact that a proposal is good. So my question to the sponsor group is whether they believe that the timing of implementation of other warrant articles that people put together are not important to the sponsors or to town meeting as a body, because I'm concerned the sponsors are setting a bad precedent tonight to an already kind of nearly dysfunctional town meeting that is meeting 15 nights that used to meet seven nights. Mr. Van Squick, as the representative of the petitioner, you have the job of answering this question. Thank you very much. Kate um, points out correctly that the, the difference in, is, is not great, but there is a difference. Um, it's the difference between implementation in 2023 or waiting until 2024. Um, but I think she put her finger on the reason that the select board unanimously wanted to do this. And um, Tommy, of course, wants to do it. Um, uh, and David Pollack and the advisory committee took their job very seriously and wrote a great report on it uh, when she said, um, if it weren't for climate change, you know, I'd be voting no. And I think maybe that's the whole point here. Um, certain rare occasions um, call for an urgency that is tan that is equivalent to the urgency of the problem. And that was what guided the select board in its decision to vote unanimously to approve the calling of this town meeting. But I thank Kate for the question. Thank you, Linda Pelkey. You have a, uh, you say your original question was not answered? Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. Linda Olson Pelkey, Precinct 17. Um, sorry to backtrack, but yes, my question was not understood or answered correctly. Um, maybe a suggestion of not um, muting people immediately after they ask their question, but allowing um, them to do a follow-up might be helpful in the future. But so my question was, that slide that David showed us from the DOER presentation said that the specialized code, applying it to multifamily required any building larger than 12,000 square feet multifamily to be passive house. So my question was, for a multifamily building that is less than 12,000 square feet, it is still guided by, governed by the commercial code, but are there additional requirements in the specialized code, such as the pre-wiring and the solar panels? And um, maybe we don't have an answer to that, but I think people should keep that in mind because we just heard from Rebecca um, speaking about affordable housing and doing passive house, and yet this passive house requirement would not be applicable for buildings of a smaller scale. So that, that was my follow-up question. Hey, Mr. Bennett, do you have an answer for that? Okay, Mr. Vitolo says he has an answer for that. And 
I will call on you, Mr. Vitolo, but then I am going to ask Mr. Bennett if he agrees with your answer. Thank you, Tommy Vitolo, uh, town meeting member at large. I apologize. My hand was actually uh, in response to a very different answer to uh, Ms. Silbaugh's question. Um, I, I don't have uh, the specific answer for this question at hand. Okay. And that is not the way we go about answering questions at, <laughs> at town meeting. No, I do not recognize your hand. So anyway, uh, okay, Mr. Bennett, can you answer Ms. Pelkey's question? Sure. So uh, Linda, I do I have to ask the next question. So it's great. It's less than 12,000. And then are any of the dwelling units um, greater than 4,000? No. So no, then you've got um, according to this, this is off the table, right in the chart, it's, uh, you would go to EV ready, uh, you'd do an EV ready, uh, you could do a passive house or hers, and you could do a net zero, uh, with three other conditions, uh, with respect to electric, mixed use, and other, um, fuels. So does that include requirements beyond the stretch code? This is all in the specialized code. Um, I'm going to say yes because it's it's not kicking me back to the. There okay. Are, where, it will, where it would kick you back to the stretch code. Um, and so it doesn't have the pre-wiring for all electric. If you do mixed fuel. I could I could get back to you on that. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is just you know I'm I'm just looking at the table here. If I if I dig down deep. Uh, there are many of those requirements, depending again, again on the pathway, where you do have to provide that um, pre-wiring if you choose like a mixed fuel um, um, option. Uh, and I, I'll try to look that up and get an answer in a few minutes if you'd like. Thank you, Perry Grossman. I will note that at this point, we have two people uh, waiting to make comments, Susie Roberts and Rosalind Feldberg. I do not know whether they are positive or negative, but we have Mr. Grossman, Mr. Englander, Jonathan Davis, and Lisa Cunningham in line to speak, and they are all speaking in favor of the article. So, uh, Mr. Grossman, you are next. Hi there, uh, Perry Grossman, town meeting member, precinct five. I'm speaking in favor of Warren Article 1. I've been reviewing it uh, and the specialized energy code uh, technical guidance document. I consider it to be epic uh, poetry. Uh, I didn't have, uh, I wanted to recite it from memory, but I was not allowed enough time for that, unfortunately. But uh, as epic poetry, uh, I do think that we, have great heroes in our midst that brought us here today. And I wanted to thank them in particular, Lisa Cunningham, leveraging her experience as an architect and organizing building car decarbonization networks, Jesse Gray, leading ZAB, and stressing the point that we cannot energy efficiency our way out of the climate crisis, indicating that we have to stop burning things. And Tommy Vitolo getting it done at the state level corralling his colleagues with a progressive vision aimed at battling the beast of climate change. Uh, so just some points, the sooner we take this on, the better. July 1st, 2023, sounds good to me in order to meet our climate policy goals. And uh, we can meet the six month requirement of uh, DOER by addressing it tonight. Uh, I appreciate the advisory committee's support of this and the call for more stringent energy efficient uh, energy efficiency requirements and also the recognizing that there are all electric and mixed fuel uh, paths. Um, my understanding is that we want to stick to the DOER guidelines that had input from many people in order to avoid potential conflicts with the attorney general or the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, I also understand uh, that pre-wiring may be required and this seems a, a sensible 
uh, approach when, when applicable, it helps us get ready for the future for EVs in particular. In addition, solar is a great uh, ener energy source. We get energy from the sun and solar costs are coming down. That also seems sensible. Uh, as Tommy Vitolo has mentioned, uh, the grid is currently about 50% uh, clean and is getting cleaner. And also the roadmap bill is uh, boosting offshore wind. And I think also we need to consider that uh, grid planners uh, do know that the wind does not blow all the time and that the sun does not shine all the time. And they are taking that into account. Uh, so addressing climate change is expensive, but my understanding is that it's more expensive not to address it. So thank you. Please support Warren Article 1. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Kavanaugh has moved to call the question. It's been seconded by Mr. Wyshynski. We will vote now on whether or not to call the question. The people waiting to speak are Mr. Englander, Jonathan Davis, Ms. Cunningham, uh, Susie Roberts, Rosalind Feldberg, and it will take a two-thirds vote to pass the motion and the question will drop now. You have 45 seconds. The motion to call the question passes with 204 yes, 18 no, and three abstentions. We will now move on to the uh, motion itself, which can be found at the uh, advisory committee's report, JC supplement number one, page seven through nine. So you will be voting on whether or not to adopt the specialized energy code as specified and set forth on the pages I just cited. It has to pass by a majority vote. We will have 45 seconds and the vote will drop now. Get 202 yes, 19 no, 8 abstentions. Okay, the motion passes with 202 votes yes, 19 no, and 8 abstentions. We will now merely move on to article number 2. Okay, article number 2 is a fairly straightforward article having to do with whether or not Brookline should provide information on ballot questions to Brookline residents before they vote on ballot questions. This would be in the form of pamphlets, I assume, uh, which the state regularly sends out on statewide questions, but Brookline has not sent out 
rather the information is currently provided on the ballots themselves. So we will begin our discussion. Uh, the uh, article has been moved by Ms. Hamilton, excuse me, Chair Hamilton, and seconded by Jocelyn Murphy. The speaker will begin with Ms. Hamilton. And I very much regret this may be the last time we hear a presentation by Ms. Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Heather Hamilton speaking for a unanimous select board. Warrant Article 2 is a good governance policy. There is an option in Mass General Law known as Section 18B that allows communities to provide a mechanism for providing residents with clear, sub substantive, nonpartisan information about the local ballot questions. Section 18B mandates the town equivalent of the Commonwealth's Red Book information for voters. In towns where Section 18B is in effect, town council's office prepares a fair and concise summary of each question, including a one sentence statement describing the effect of a yes or a no vote. Council's office also seeks reviews and approves short written statements, no more than 150 words for and against the question from persons determined by council to be best able to present the arguments. The information is mailed to all households wherein a person whose name appears on the current voting list for the city, town, or district resides. In Brookline, that is currently about 25,000 households. Brookline's recent ballot question concerning the rehabilitation of fire stations generated hundreds of inquiries from residents who did not understand what they were being asked to vote on. This was partly because state law severely restricts the language that can be printed on the physical ballot, and also because the town currently lacks the legal authority to provide such critical information ahead of election day. Adopting the clear framework for information giving outlined in section 18B would be a major step toward remedying this very real problem. This measure would promote fairness and transparency, two of Brookline's core values. Please join the select board in voting affirmative action on warrant article two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sean Lynn Jones. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm Sean Lynn Jones from Precinct One, speaking in favor, favor of Article Two. I think Chair Hamilton just did a great job of laying out how Article Two's process under Section 18B would work, and she made a good case for favorable action. Um, I'll just try to add a few things. Um, I think the case is overwhelmingly persuasive here that the process would be beneficial. The mailing to households with voters would increase participation and turnout. It would remind people that there's an election and it would let them know what's on the ballot and what's at stake. It would help to inform people of the nature of what they're voting on by providing an explanation of the ballot question and the implications of a yes or a no vote. And finally, it would provide uh, some information on the arguments for and against each ballot question. Uh, although I don't think those paragraphs would be a substitute for any of the things that, for example, the League of Women Voters in Brookline does, such as hosting debates, it would be a great start to letting people know what the arguments were. These are all you know, great reasons to vote in favor of Article 2, and there is a need to do uh, it quickly uh, at this town meeting so that it will be in effect for the upcoming May election, at which it looks very likely that we will have three uh, questions on the ballot. Uh, for uh, discussion, two related to uh, overrides and debt exclusions and one related to cannabis uh, stores. Now, I had some questions about Article 2, and I looked into them and did a little bit more research. One of the things I wondered was, why hasn't Brookline done this? Uh, I contacted former select board members and others, and the answer was, we don't know. Um, we never really talked about it. We're not sure. I couldn't find any reason why Brookline had not accepted the provisions of Section uh, 18B of Chapter 53. 
I do think, however, it's very important that they be accepted now for three reasons. Uh, we no longer have a print newspaper in this town. We used to have as many as two, and they were great sources of information through their letters and their articles on every ballot question. Second, um, this time around, we don't have an override study committee as in previous uh, elections in which there was a proposition two and a half override on the ballot. The select board has chosen to make the town school partnership committee, uh, in effect, the override study committee. Now there are some advantages to doing that, but it means we no longer have the community engagement of an override study committee, bringing in people who weren't fully immersed in Brookline politics and government, a committee that holds lots of meetings, hearings, and generates an extensive report with a lot of analysis that's then available. Uh, this process will help substitute for that. And third, as we saw in November, we can no longer assume that there will be organized uh, committees or select board members who are willing and able to provide the ballot question information that we've had in previous elections. All of these are reasons for doing this now. I also looked into the experience of other cities and uh, towns in the state. I found some uh, language which is uh, incorporated into the advisory committee report, uh, particularly from Westwood, which would be analogous to what might be used in this sort of mailing and what it would look like if Brookline were to adopt uh, Article 2 and the process under Section 18B. I couldn't find any reasons why other uh, communities had problems with the 18B process, except for the very small towns wondered if they had the staff time and the money to follow the guidelines that are provided for in state law. Uh, I don't think that would be an issue in Brookline. Uh, I was you know, very uh, you know, happy to find out during the advisory committee process, and you can see it in the advisory committee's report, that there's a possible timeline for complying with the deadlines in section 18B that would also enable the select board to have ample time to formulate especially an operating override question and put it on the ballot. It's not easy to formulate an operating override question. You have to look at the overall fiscal picture, set budget priorities, and then think very hard about the actual wording of the question and the structure. And usually it's taken until you know, March, at least that's what happened in 2018, the last time we had an operating override. But uh, if you look at the town clerk's town timeline, the decision could be made as late as March 28th, and we could still get this mailing out before early voting began and meet all the legal deadlines. Now, I hope for the sake of the town clerk uh, that the select board decides a little bit earlier than that, and he probably feels that way too. This is not necessarily the thing you want to do at the last minute, but the timeline works and it's feasible for us to uh, comply and to give people the information before early voting even begins. So for um, all these reasons and what uh, Chair Hamilton said, this is a good governance measure. It increases fairness and transparency. And now is a particularly good time for uh, Brookline to accept Section 18B. I hope you'll join me in voting favorable action on Article 2. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> With a motion to call the question by somebody who's in Israel and is tired. Um, I'll allow it. Okay. Uh, although we have two people waiting to speak, uh, Jonathan Golden and Ernest Fry, and it may take longer to vote on the question than it would to allow them to speak. But uh, do I have a second on the motion to call the question? Which is from Lisa Schatz. Alec Leibowitz is, Leibowitz is uh, seconding that. Oh, and Jocelyn Murphy was wind up to speak. That's true. She had seconded the motion. I apologize. Anyway, we are going to vote on whether to call the question. Oh, and Jennifer Goldsmith had a question as well. Anyway, all right. Uh, drop, drop the ballot. Too bad. No, Sean Lynn Jones was from the AC. Oh, you're right. 
No, I didn't have a name. Oh, it was Joslyn. Whoops. I apologize, I did not realize I was on a live mic. So if I made any intemperate statements, please ignore them. The motion passes with 183 yes, 32 no, and eight abstentions. We will now vote on the motion itself. And I apologize for people I may have passed over. Uh, so we will now vote on Article 2 itself, whether or not to provide information to Brookline residents on local ballot questions. It is the main motion is found in the select board report, which is in the combined reports page. Jennifer Goldsmith, I'm not even sure you're allowed to ask the question at this point, so it better be good. I, I hope it is, and forgive me, I also have COVID like Sandy, so cut me a little slack. I'm just trying to understand, I know that many of the things we vote on, if there's a cost associated, we need to understand where the money's coming from. And no, that- I'm sorry, no, no, not appropriate. We are voting on the question. Okay. We are voting on the question, which is found on page 2-2 of the combined reports. So once voting has started or it is being called, do not ever say you have a point of order or anything else. And I apologize. That is right up there with a point of order for saying you want to wish somebody happy birthday. Okay, let's uh, majority vote. Let's drop it. The motion passes with 221 yes, one no, and four abstentions. Uh, a couple of things to say before I will entertain a motion to dissolve. First, thank you all for showing up, spending your post-vacation holiday time uh, to this meeting. And thank you to the staff for showing up and helping out tonight. And thank you to the administration staff, especially Melissa Goff for putting in time over the holidays to help us put this together. And as I said, God willing, we will be meeting in person in May and town meeting member, Eric Hyatt, I have not forgotten your promise to bake cookies. So uh, we will be seeing each other in May after the next election and I will accept a motion to dissolve the actual dissolution will be effective at five o'clock tomorrow, May 11th. So Michael Burstein has made a motion to dissolve, seconded by Harry Friedman and a thank you from our friend Lisa Schatz in Israel. Okay.
The motion passes with 211 yes and no one voting no and three one no. <laughs> I will not I will not reveal the identity of the person who votes no. And three abstentions, we are dissolved. Thank you all.